Coming up to the research and technology breakout session, uh, my name is Jeremy Sims. I'm a San Bernardino Community College District. Um, before we get into the first talk here, <clears throat> a few housekeeping items. This is a live stream, and so during the questions and answers, we ask that the presenter could repeat the audience's questions since we don't have the uh, microphone. And then at 5:20, during the or for our AT&T and uh, Scenic talk about VOIP, we're expected to have a big turnout and a lot of questions and answers. So. We'll, um, shortly following that, we'll have some refreshments, so feel free to take part with that. But into the talk, um, we've got Kurt Beckham. He's a principal architect at, at, and Brocade's lead representative at the ONF, where he is chair of the Forwarding Abstracts Work Group and a member of the Chip Makers Advisory Board. He spent some years in product management before returning to engineering, where he is now focusing on enhancing the open flow standard to accelerate hardware adoption in new features. So give it up for Kurt. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks for the opportunity. I guess I hold the whole thing. No. And thanks for the opportunity today. Uh, so as we just said, I'm, my focus is on SDN. It's a, an important uh, um, segment really of the networking market and especially in research and education space uh, and for brocade. So in this presentation, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take another quick look at SDN from a, a higher level uh, just to reset the context. Maybe you don't all spend um, your days focused on SDN the way I do. Uh, you've probably seen bits of it, but, but let me just take another quick look at it. And then my focus most of the time is on uh, things that, on open flow and other things that go on at, at the Open Networking Foundation where there's a bit of a new culture uh, developing, which is uh, timely, really, uh, where it's moved from, from you know, the, all about the promise of open flow to a bit more about how do we make stuff that actually works. And, uh, and then I'll talk a bit about open daylight, which happens now to be joining up with open flow or with uh, ONF and trying to make open flow uh, functionality more uh, productive and, and scalable. Um, and so the open daylight is, is kind of an important player in the SDN space. And then I'll talk a little bit about some campus use cases uh, for SDN. So uh, again, this 10,000 foot uh, picture, uh, SDN, the, the core or main definitions around software defined networking, um, it's a simple idea really, but it has these, these far, re far ranging uh, implications. Um, the idea is to separate the control plane from the data plane uh, which means get the control, move the control out of that hardware box is really what it means. And, and uh, what, that, what they're also really trying to say when they talk about it that way, when the, the proponents of SDN and OpenFlow talk about it are, please, you know, break this lock-in that I've been experiencing for so long. Uh, if I want a new feature, I have to buy this particular hardware because, you know, that's the, the software that makes it work is also coupled to the hardware. And this doesn't seem right. Innovation is very slow. It's kind of up to the, to the vendors, you know, standards bodies are controlled by the vendors, et cetera. Please cut it all loose so that then, you know, the software developers can uh, innovate at software speeds and, and I can get the features that I want in a more timely fashion. And I would say this has been true about networking for decades and at a certain level, and it wasn't that painful until the advent of cloud. Uh, and the cloud stuff has really, um, produced a, a number of challenges that uh, really make the slow innovation rate um, excruciating. Uh, the software-defined networking really took on um, some momentum um, with OpenFlow uh, and the creation of the ONF, which was about three years ago. There's things that, that are legitimately SDN that really predated that, but it wasn't a, a, as hot a topic until around that time frame. Uh, those early days, SDN was very layer two, layer three, sort of Ethernet um, and IPv4 focused. Uh, there was a lot of interest in the campus because it was very, um, it was kind of driven out of Stanford and, and Cal and some other campuses, but largely those and largely um, research uh, and education and not much in the enterprise. Um, despite the, the lack of enterprise focus, there was still a lot of talk about the data center and, and uh, if you know about Nasira, they were that was where they were focusing their early work even three years ago. Um, and then oddly, campus kind of uh, faded briefly and there was more interest in the WAN. Um, now campus is back, which is kind of fun. Um, 
and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. And meanwhile, software defined networking is looking to go down and control the optical equipment. Uh, optical transport folks are very interested in this. They can see how they can add more value that way. And people are also looking to push up into layer four through seven. A lot of that is coming out of the telcos that are doing uh, what they call network functions virtualization, which is one of the items down in the lower bullet. So Open Networking Foundation from 2011. Actually, slightly before that was OpenStack, but it was uh, fairly low key until, at least in my experience, until actually after the ONF um, got a little more attention. So that was 2010, mostly focused on orchestrating the data center. But, uh, and it, in fact, networking was not, maybe that's why it wasn't that visible to me. The networking piece of OpenStack was not a, uh, uh, an equal player in the in the OpenStack picture. There was compute and storage and networking kind of joined the party a little bit later. Network functions virtualization, that was again the telcos uh, managed through the European uh, Telecom Specifications Institute, Etsy. Uh, and even though it says European, really um, worldwide uh, telcos are members. Um, and they decided that was a good place to manage uh, the idea of doing a lot of network functionality in servers instead of uh, in custom hardware. And Open Daylight, which came around about a year ago uh, as a consortium doing an open source controller um, and uh, that's a Linux Foundation project and it's, it's turning out to be a, an important player although it has, it has work to do as well. So a quick f uh, look at this SDN framework. Um, th there's uh, Open Daylight, Open Flow, so there's partly layers and up and down from top to bottom from the physical infrastructure through virtualization control and so on up at the top orchestration uh, and then side to side we have network compute storage OpenStack really kind of spans the side to side but it's very much at the top uh, open daylight and open flow uh, are a little lower down and focused on networking off to the side uh, so just a, a visualization of what we already uh, just touched on uh, here's another picture of OpenStack, and now, now it seems like networking is this equal weight player. You know, it shows there between compute and storage. Um, uh, that, in, in this picture, you think of networking as IP networking. Uh, there's also work underway to add fiber channel into the, the uh, OpenStack environment um, by a number of players, Brocade included, uh, but uh, a lot of storage players as well want their fiber channel storage available in uh, especially private cloud and OpenStack is not limited to like the public cloud infrastructure which is uh, super low cost and, and tends not to look at fiber channel uh, uh, at the moment. But virtual private cloud which is um, service provider, uh, they, they do uh, some fiber channel stuff. I won't spend too much time on OpenStack. And, oh, one thing I will say is that one way that all of this fits, in, fits together is that um, open daylight or other controllers can be used within an open stack environment to manage open flow. So open stack, open daylight, open flow can all be part of the same picture. It's not, it's not an either or kind of a model. I mentioned NFV, network functions virtualization. This is that telco model. Um, essentially, if you look at their investment story over the years, they've always been the kind of guys that wanted to buy a box and use it for 20 years. Uh, amortize it forever um, and uh, that was part of how they got, a, got you lower cost. It also, in addition to the cost of the boxes, for them to go out in various locations and, and send a crew out and install something and then of course you forgot that, that little bolt or there's some piece of equipment, something failed, you know, just maintenance on, on anything that changes quickly is excruciating for the telephone company. And so shifting from, oh, as well as how do you buy the right size, the right amount of horsepower for something that's constantly moving? You know, how many, how many uh, different specialized appliances do you need? In the server model, servers do also um, age out, but you can use an older server. You may just need um, more of them, so you don't necessarily have to retire it right away. But then also, if you, if you have product A or feature A and feature B and you're not sure you know, how you're going to balance those on servers, you can, you can move them around in a soft way, which is very difficult to do with appliances. So this, this NFV is actually central to their, uh, it's a strategic question for them. It's not just a technology thing. It allows them to innovate rapidly by turning over software instead of turning over hardware. Uh, all right, so that was kind of the quick overview of, of SDN in a number of different communities. And now I'll dive a little deeper into what I spend time on. This is uh, 
um, my soup to nuts chart. I won't um, force it all down your throat. Uh, I think you might value this in the slide decks that you have access to afterward. Part of what it's about is showing that um, there's a lot going on at the ONF, often behind the scenes. So, uh, you know, I get this all the time. It's the open networking foundation that you can't see into, right? So it's open in the sense that we publish open standards, but um, unfortunately you have to pay the fee in order to get access to the mailing lists and to get access to the website. So it's not open in the way a number of other standards bodies are. Uh, and so I partly regard it as, as um, uh, really an opportunity or duty that I have and others uh, that are involved to, to share what's going on behind the scenes. So there was, uh, and I mentioned that at the very beginning, that we're shifting from this kind of uh, hype phase and promise phase to how do we deliver stuff that actually works. That was, I, I came from product development. Um, I, was, I was never that much into to research myself. Um, and so from the very beginning, I was like, oh, how do, I, how do I do some cool stuff with this? Even though I'm in standards, I, I want to be able to take good ideas into the uh, development teams and, and get things going. And, and quickly found some issues, uh, along with other folks that were at Google and, and already deploying this stuff quietly uh, behind the scenes. Um, and so my working group, if you, as you see there, there was this uh, group in the, the light blue called the Future Group, uh, Future Discussion Group, and we were talking about ideas that the Google guys had brought up, and, and I'd sort of thought of independently, but they were definitely ahead of me. Um, that morphed into what became uh, uh, a charter that we proposed that was very aggressive and was very futuristic, um, and the uh, powers that be over there said, whoa, you need to kind of slow down. We're kind of focused on today's open flow for now. Can you, can you add some of that value in today's open flow? And that's what created the Forwarding Abstractions Working Group. And as you can see, so we were doing that more than two years ago is when we got started. And it took us almost a year to actually get a charter. Uh, and then we've been working on it for a year and a half. And, and as I said, I'm a bit new to standards. I was too, you know, kind of overly aggressive in my expectations, but maybe that turned out to be a good thing. We're now pushing the thing out in the next couple of months. Um, and uh, some, uh, I'll show you in a minute, there's a vendor that's, that's kind of got a pre-standard version of this, which is uh, pretty cool. It's not Rocade yet. Um, and uh, it, it, it just turns out timing-wise that we, it was good that we were aggressive. Um, and even though we were a little slow, the combination of slow but aggressive uh, happened to time out right. Uh, OpenFlow 1.0 is actually about four, four years old. It predated the ONF by quite a bit. Um, and then there was an, even an OpenFlow 1.1 that, that uh, predated ONF by about uh, a week or two weeks or something like that. But nobody really adopted 1.1 or 1.2. It was 1.3 that, uh, through some encouragement and so on, is the one that got more adoption. And those products have been in sort of trials and beta, and now a few of them are actually GA, and uh, they're coming out. And I'll talk a little bit about the difference between 1.0 and 1.3 in a little bit. Um, this is the beginning of that, so a, a kind of a techie nerdy picture. But um, the simple idea of OpenFlow is that uh, this box over on the, uh, toward the right of your screen there, the, well, the little teeny box is a controller that talks to an OpenFlow device, which is typically called a switch in OpenFlow space, even if it's a router um, or some other device. It's always just to referred to as the switch. That it has a, a table that controls the behavior, and that table has a series of flow entries populated by the controller, prioritized by the controller. Uh, and when a, a packet is received, it, it matches against the matching fields, and the highest priority matching entry uh, is the controlling entry, if it matches any of them. Uh, there's, then there's a match everything entry that should be installed to, to, do what, to tell it what to do if there's no, no other match. Um, so this single entry will match, the high priority match will tell it what the actions are, and it'll, it'll count, do counters, and so on. So uh, logically, a fairly straightforward picture. Um, with, with a lot of matching fields and some interesting actions, even with a single table, you can do a fair bit of interesting stuff with OpenFlow, as people have done with OpenFlow 1.0 for a couple of years now. What's not really clear until you dig into it is that in, in interesting use cases, you can run out of entries very quickly. You end up having a, a product problem where, oh, well, I've got a, a 100 MAC addresses and 200 uh, uh, router subnets and, and in various cases VLANs and whatnot, you start having multiplier effects going on and uh, you can use up thousands and tens of thousands of entries 
even though you only have a few hundred um, real needs. If you had separate tables and you could decouple them, you might only need less than a thousand entries. But uh, so multiple tables um, is attractive. And so with the next version of OpenFlow, they introduced multiple tables in OpenFlow 1.1. They didn't add IPv6, and they didn't have it at MPLS, and they, there was a bunch of things that were missing, and so uh, for various reasons, nobody really adopted 1.1, and it wasn't that long before 1.2 came out, and, and then 1.3, and so several things were added that made OpenFlow 1.3 a bit more compelling, but it still had this problem. Uh, well, it had multiple tables. Let me go back here just a second. The, the thing with multiple tables is now it's one at a time. You deal with one table at a time, but now there's multiple entries that come into the picture. It'll match in one table, and then it'll go to another table, and it can match there. And, and so it's not so clear what a flow is, where it used to be really clearly defined by a single table entry. Now a flow is more complex, and the actions that apply to the flow are more complex. And basically the job of the switch to try and figure out what to do with all the messages is, uh, well, it's effectively uh, unwieldy and impractical. And that was one reason why newer versions of OpenFlow were not well adopted. So, okay, great, they, OpenFlow provided a bunch of power, but the, the folks that defined it were not um, looking at the problem from the switch perspective. And as a result, the switch vendors were kind of left a little bit out in the cold. Well, Forwarding Abstraction Working Group, that was those cry, that crowd of folks at Google and myself and so on that saw these problems and said, we need to do something in order to make these multiple tables workable. And, and I won't drill all the way through it, but we created a new frame, framework that allows you to sort out what the tables are supposed to do and how they're connected together before runtime, because that was a difficult part. At runtime, you get all these messages and the switch you had no idea. By spelling this out in advance, uh, the problems are solved, and it turns out it's much more deterministic, and people who run operational networks like this, and uh, uh, the researchers who like to change things on the fly, they still have the option of using um, things like soft switches and server-based switches or, or other devices. Um, but it also turns out uh, the time it takes to, to do the, the, oops, excuse me, to do the, um, uh, the pre-runtime work is, is not prohibitive. So now the, the researchers are willing to uh, uh, get along with the network operators and say, okay, yeah, this model, we can live with it. And so uh, our framework is becoming adopted. And so now I'll talk a little bit more about what's happened in just the, the last few weeks. As I mentioned, there's been a bit of a uh, uh, culture change, you know, sort of a sea change from that um, dreamland, wish list, uh, pie in the sky futures, I keep doing that. Um, and now in the last uh, oh, year or, or so, moving more toward uh, functionality. As people started to bring out 1.3 and they did plug fests, uh, my working group started to um, do a better job of articulating uh, and um, an important uh, element up there, it says Chip Makers Advisory Board. So the ONF, it seemed like their desire was for uh, the chip makers, which include companies like Brocade, the system vendors that make their own chips, but also the merchant silicon vendors like Broadcom and, and Marvell and uh, uh, Intel now these days. Um, you know, why haven't they given us an OpenFlow chip? You know, we, we described OpenFlow, and, and it's been a couple of years. There should be chips. There should be OpenFlow chips. Well, they didn't really understand the economics. Uh, chips cost uh, 25 to 50 million to make. Um, we need to have very clear specifications, and we need to have a very uh, clear market demand so that we can build a chip that we're confident will meet the requirements and uh, somebody will buy it. You know, imagine. Uh, so it's not, it's not just a, a charitable move uh, at, at that scale. Uh, in, in software and open source, it's amazing what you can do with a few grad students, but that, that model just doesn't quite work with, uh, uh, with uh, the scale of silicon now. Especially, you know, they want, it, oh, they, they want OpenFlow and they want it to go 40 gig on, you know, 16 ports or 32 ports. So it's quite, a, it's quite an interesting chip. Uh, and that was, so the early attitude at the ONF was me, me, my feature, and people jumping up and down and say, I want it all, and, and you know, expanding and adding working groups and optical and wireless and solar and nuclear and, all, you know, basically heading off in, in all directions. And, and that made it sort of hard to herd the cats and, and figure out which features to do when. Um, there has been a lot of progress. We've, we've gotten better, um, but oh, I've got a uh, tendency to touch that button. Um, 
it was a focus on the revolution without figuring out how we were going to actually deliver, you know, day-to-day -day functionality like uh, plumbing and, and trash pickup. Uh, and that's the thing that's changed is it's moved more toward, you know, uh, we need to uh, demonstrate real workable stuff. Um, the new chips, they may come, but they're not here now, and we need to deliver working functionality. So it's not just that you'll have a revolution and then, and then magic will happen and allow you to deliver workable products. You have to actually think about how you're going to do that with what you have today. Uh, and now we have a bunch of these, as I mentioned, there's a bunch of vendors bringing out OpenFlow 1.3. Brocaden announced uh, our 1.3 support uh, last week on uh, several product lines. Um, and what's interesting is they don't all work together. Now, actually, they do work pretty well together if you only use a single flow table, kind of like the OpenFlow 1.0 model I mentioned. It's when you start using multiple tables that you have trouble. And then there's a lot of optional features because they've added so many features and they said, well, not every box supports that feature, so we'll just make it optional. That turns out to be problematic too. That, you know, and that's not just a problem on the switch side. Now on the controller side or the application side, if there's all these optional features, what can I, what can I count on? Uh, and there again, uh, the work in my working group has uh, helped with that optional feature problem. And we saw some of these things, as I said, going back a couple of years, Google and so on. And we kept saying, look, we're going to have to figure out how to make the today's silicon, today's networking devices and boxes work. Uh, people want to buy stuff today that's going to be SDN capable tomorrow when, you know, when the apps are out. I mean, this is just reality. We have to do this. And yet, uh, a lot of folks didn't really want to hear that at first. Anyway, that Chipmakers Advisory Board, that's the CAB. We sort of explained some stuff last summer, and uh, I think that helped folks understand that, that they couldn't just hang in there another couple of weeks and, and expect to see some wonderful announcement that was going to uh, solve the problems. So several other things have happened. There's been problems in a, a, the configuration protocol. They've defined one, but the adoption's very low. There's sort of a competitive protocol that uh, the open uh, the open B switch guys Nasir and so on they define their own protocol and it's actually fairly broadly adopted so maybe we need to figure out how to take advantage uh, of both of those and, and win some better adoption we had problems we had a working group that had a sort of was dysfunctional because the chair was so overwhelmed with his day job uh, that's gotten corrected um, open daylight I mentioned the, the uh, Linux Foundation project with a whole boatload of uh, you know big consortium of vendors. There, was a, there were several open source controllers before, no obvious leader. Now, th now they're sort of an obvious leader, but it's also uh, kind of an a, uh, early stages, you know, uh, immature thing. It, it just has, it had its release a month ago, its first release, Hydrogen. Um, and uh, it's considered a, a developer's release. It's, it's a big step forward, but there's still more to do in open daylight. Um, and then forwarding attractions, my working group, has gotten a lot farther down the road. We're about to get our stuff pushed out the door. And as I mentioned, there's a, uh, a vendor who's come out with a pre-standard, actually it's Broadcom. Um, they didn't announce it as such, so you're going on my word. They didn't say it, uh, I did, blame me. But uh, in fact, um, they are very much uh, looking forward and helping uh, the, the advance of this effort, which will make the, uh, the multiple table stuff that I mentioned, as well as a lot of the optional functionality a lot of those problems uh, will get settled out. Um, the Open Daylight Project. So I mentioned that already. It's a controller project, a uh, Linux Foundation project, so it's kind of legit. Um, uh, Brocade's uh, Dave Meyer, one of our CTOs, is the chair of the Technical Steering Committee. Uh, we wrote a big check like a bunch of those other guys up there to get our platinum status. Uh, it's interesting because it's open source and, and anybody and their brother can just join and contribute. But there is a governing board, and that's what you get. You get a board seat when you pay that big money, and you, you also get the marketing clout of saying, I wrote a big check. <laughs> but it, it says that I do support it. Um, and then the other members, uh, they end up sharing a seat, like they get half a seat or a rotating seat or something. Uh, but they can participate. But even then, you, know, they didn't, you can participate without paying. So um, I find that uh, kind of interesting. It's, a, it's as much marketing as anything. Uh, but it also funds, you know, their summits and, and hack fests and so on, like there's another hack fest coming up in a, two or three weeks. Um, and this is, the, this is now a year old diagram. They've enhanced this a little bit, but structurally it doesn't, it doesn't change that much. What, what does change, and this is a bit more mature in the Open Daylight Project, that the, they imagine that they'll have a couple of things that are different from traditional controllers. One is 
that down at the bottom, it's not just open flow. They, they mention open flow by name. It is meant to control open flow devices, but it's not necessarily strictly open flow. Uh, that's kind of realistic. There'll be other devices in the, in the picture or other things that you want to control. So I think that's a maturity aspect. And then also traditional uh, open flow controllers, what they exposed upwards was basically the flow tables. So it didn't, it didn't put any abstractions in place. It didn't hide the hardware very much. And especially as we go into more complex hardware and richer, broader from optical to firewall to NAT, and et cetera, you know, you need to have more abstractions. And, and essentially what they need to offer upwards is services, not uh, low level functionality like flow entries. Uh, and so they have a services abstraction layer in uh, open daylight, which is uh, it's one of the, that rectangle is a little ways down. So, so that's a, a big leap forward in terms of maturity. There's still quite a ways to go um, in, in uh, maturing this, but there's so many people now, um, it's gained a lot of momentum. Uh, there will be uh, a helium release this summer, and the focus is on stability. So it's got a bunch of good functionality. Uh, they had this aggressive plan to get it out in uh, early December, uh, a little too aggressive, but they did get it out, magically enough, the day uh, before the summit started. I think that was uh, by plan. But um, uh, if you look at what they, what they did, first they had to kind of figure out how they're going to organize themselves and, and you know, choose leadership and so on. And so it wasn't until July that they had a bunch of projects. And then they decided to try and cram them all in. And uh, they were largely successful. And so having gone through all that learning curve and, and uh, figured out that they're a, work a, workable, um, uh, a workable organization and a workable project with lots of interest in the community, uh, I think it'll do uh, much better going forward. So here's a laundry list of the projects. And uh, there's another list of projects, including, well, it's in early, early, like early proposal stage, uh, the TTP work that my working group is working on. It requires support in the controller and we're looking to Open Daylight to be one of the first ones to support it, but by no means is it limited to Open Daylight. It, you know, we want it to be across the uh, controller spectrum. So other controllers, probably the other big leading uh, controller nowadays is Ryu, uh, which uh, I think was started by NTT in Japan. So um, moving on to campus use cases, and how am I doing here? Oh, I'm running short of time. So. Um, one I would say, I already sort of mentioned this earlier, that campus was popular early and then slightly neglected. Maybe it was budget, it's hard to say what all it was. Um, and uh, I think maybe it was a trickier problem also, but now campus is kind of back. There's the big one, which is really big, bigger really at universities than uh, at enterprise. So in some ways, I think this is the uh, ideal case for universities, um, where normally it's like, well, I'll go solve something at the, at the enterprise first and then sell it to the university. This one, I think you should solve it at the university first because um, you kind of got this, the problem uh, in the worst way here. Well, maybe that'll convince people to do it the cheaper way first, but the demand is really there at the university to, to handle the variety and, and mobility and volume of device. Um, uh, one problem has been in, in wireless, but that's being fixed uh, soon. Um, and so this is, this I think is a key uh, leading use case uh, on the campus. There's a campus traffic isolation case, not just the university campus, but um, Brocade campus even, for example. We have a number of external service, uh, service providers that come in over our network. And by and large, we actually have a separate network instead of having um, instead of running them isolated over the same network. So that's a huge use case. It's effectively, a, a, you might call it a traffic engineering case, but um, uh, I call it traffic isolation. And there's a, a, a large number of other cases as well. Some of them are sort of non, what would, were not originally thought of as campus use cases, but are now migrating into the campus. Uh, Science Ready DMZ is mainstream campus. It's, it's you know, that border between the WAN and the, in the campus or the WAN in the data center, um, where you want to have now this huge fat pipe that you don't want to uh, burn out your uh, firewall with. Um, specialized bandwidth, uh, that's really traffic engineering, like for video links on campus or, or to other campuses. Um, and then maybe special treatment of certain applications uh, and uh, security is a, a special case on the campus. And that's it. It's, uh, I'm told to wrap it up. Do I have time for a single question? If there's a question to... Yes? Um, where does VXLAN and NVGRE fit in? Are they part of OpenFlow or off to the side? 
Um, so they are, they are data protocols, and OpenFlow is a control protocol. And in the early stages, OpenFlow didn't include the ability to, to control those data protocols. So that was a weak spot. Um, then they had a kind of a backdoor mechanism, which sort of works, and people do it, or using extensions. But coming up in 1.5, which is the next one, the next release of OpenFlow that they're looking at, they plan to make it kind of a full citizen to, to allow you the ability to control uh, those tunnels, those NBGRE and, and VXLAN tunnels. So, uh, but when people will adopt 1.5, it's hard to say. I think they'll end up using that backdoor mechanism a bit or extensions and so on for the, for the medium term. Uh, although I should mention they're now back uh, using extensions and adding extensions into older versions. So there may be a 1.3.5 that will uh, allow 1.3 uh, protocol to support those tunnels and, and similarly for, for other features. All right, looks like I'm getting the hook here. Thanks very much. <laughs>